Way back, in my very first call as a priest, I helped to lead a youth group. And we had an activity that we did once a year where they would, we would gather together and they could ask me anything they wanted to, anything. About, they could ask that any time, but we actually made a program out of it. So they could ask me about Christianity, about our church, about the faith, about our spiritual life, or about anything that was happening in the world. We called it Priest on a Hot Seat. And it was the best on-the-job training I think I've ever been given. Well, it turns out that the Pharisees like to, pr- to play priest on a hot seat as well, except their version put Jesus on the spot. They wanted to entrap him, and so they came up with the very best gotcha question they could imagine. They asked, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? The question was fiendishly clever. The Roman tax on harvests and property, determined by that census that we read about every Christmas, placed a heavy burden on the very people who would have been listening in to this conversation. To say yes to the tax would alienate the oppressed Jews of Palestine. Yet to say no to the tax would have meant that Jesus was fostering sedition. These were not good options. But was this really a question about taxes? Perhaps. You know, though, we could also say it was a question about stewardship and giving, or at least Jesus' answer was about that. If taxes are a part of civic life, then giving proportionally to God's work is a part of our spiritual lives. And we ought to value that every bit as much as we value the kingdoms of this world. This wasn't simply about taxes or stewardship, though, but rather the larger question of what do we owe to God? What do we owe to our neighbors? What do we owe to the state? Jesus is clear in some ways and less clear in others. In, he, he all but says, yes, you have to pay your taxes. No, anarchy is not a part of the kingdom of God. Yes, you should participate in the life of the community. No, you cannot simply retreat into your own private economy. Andrew Purvis writes that the theological question before us is this. What is the nature of right relations between obedience to the state and obedience to God? It's a hot topic for today, brought to you by that pesky old lectionary. So, deep breaths, everybody. But in naming the emperor, Jesus steers this boat clearly into the choppy waters of politics. And in our day, this without question turns us towards the fierce, volatile winds of an election season in which so much is at stake. Deep breaths, indeed. Now, some will say that the church needs to be a place where we can have some distance from the things that sound like partisan politics. While others will ask, How can we not be talking about what's going on in the world, about issues of justice and how we live our lives? The truth is we wouldn't be a complete church without either perspective, which means that we are a church on a hot seat because what's going on beyond our doors is happening, whether we want to look at it or not. This is a world in which all of God's children are not treated equally and are not able to be and live the lives that God intends for them. We cannot pretend that is not the case. Yet we cannot simply default either to the language of loyalists or insurrectionists, because if we do that, we're in a different kind of trouble. Jesus of Nazareth, Do we pay taxes to the emperor or not? 
The trap has been set. But this tense place can also be a productive and holy place. This could be a moment in which we reclaim what it means to enact a community of human flourishing, what it means to build a world that reflects God's imagination and God's hope for each and every one of us. And so this is ultimately about sharing and building on the reconciling love of Jesus. And you know something? We cannot do that without politics. We cannot build a community of dignity and love without speaking up about things that truly matter in the reign of God. We also can't do this without building the relationships, the relationships that are the foundation for growing out of this narrow and fearful place. So if Jesus is willing to talk about what we owe the emperor and what we don't owe him, then perhaps we can reclaim a more loving and productive politics. Now, I've always loved what Václav Havel wrote about politics. If you'll remember, he was the Czech playwright who helped keep civil society alive behind the Iron Curtain. He was imprisoned by the communists. And then after the Iron Curtain fell, he became the first president of the Czech Republic. And what he said is this, politics he wrote, is the art of the impossible. Politics can be about calculation, intrigue, pragmatic maneuvering, but it can also be about the art of improving ourselves and the world. Politics is the web of human connection and relationships that can build community, preserve it in the face of totalitarianism and oppression, move us from imagination to action, and bring about human flourishing. When the Caesars or the Pharaohs keep their thumbs on the scales, it is the work of true politics to build a capacity for justice and renewal. True politics has little to do with party or electoral strategies. Rather, this is about keeping our relationships and our imaginations alive, especially when Caesar, and maybe even a silent majority as well, would be just as happy if those imaginations went offline for a while. God makes common life possible. And so when we step back from the work of building community and we say that politics is simply Caesar's game and none of our business, we give up a particular power that the church has. Luke Bretherton, a scholar at Duke University and someone who will be joining us for a Trinity Forum later uh, some months down the road, reminds us that politics is not a bad thing. It is a foundational part of forging a moral life. We are social creatures whose flourishing depends on being embedded in some form of social life. Politics is a central way in which humans determine whether their common life is just or unjust, generous or heartless, peaceable or violent, ensures the flourishing of the few at the expense of others, or seeks the flourishing of all. Who but the church can imagine what human flourishing can look like in the eyes of our Creator? Who but the church can envision, proclaim, and work for a more just world in which all of God's children can live with dignity? Who but the church can challenge all of us when we become entrenched behind walls of class and race and wealth? Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. The brilliance of Jesus' response is that if you notice, he doesn't quite close the loop. It's not entirely clear how we're supposed to respond to this, except that the most extreme paths are out. We don't get to opt out of the common life. We don't get to treat our opponents as enemies. Nor may we give to Caesar the fidelity that belongs to God alone. 
the Pharisees and the Herodians, they demand that Jesus pick a category, pick a box for the most important issue of that day. But that's the trap. Neither choice reflects the fullness of the imagination of God. God created in us a holy imagination. Can we have the courage to use it and not let it be domesticated by those who choose not to see what God sees and who cannot envision what is possible in the loving eyes of our Creator? As followers of Jesus, we cannot be satisfied with a common life that cannot envision eternal life. Jürgen Moltmann envisions an outward-facing church living within the horizon and expectation of the coming kingdom of God. Andrew Purvis writes that if Christianity remains the cult of the private, it sanctifies life as it is. The cross of Christ forces Christians to become involved in the concrete struggle for public freedom. To the emperor, what is the emperor's? And to God, what is God's? Give to the present what belongs to the present and save for the eternal the parts in us that dwell in eternity. Now, I have good news about taxes. In heaven, there are no taxes, at least none that I've heard about. So here on earth, we can pay our taxes and we can have wonderful conversations about how much we should be giving uh, to Caesar or to Rita or to whichever tax authority happens to govern you, wherever you may be. That's where your taxes go, but your heart and your imagination belong to God. But sometimes, and think this is why I think Jesus didn't entirely close the loop on the argument, sometimes the present and the eternal overlap. This is what happens when we speak up for the powerless. This is what happens when we say not what is polite, but what is right. This is what happens when we risk ourselves. This is also what happens when we build relationships with people who see things differently. Not for how they can serve us or even how we can win, but simply because we love them and because we recognize their intrinsic dignity as well. This is politics. This is what happens when, I, when we enter our common life with a view not of what we can gain, but of what we can build, how justice can be made real, and how as the people of God, we can fully become who God created us to be.